Okay, so we will end of this end, end this day with the last session, uh, which is devoted on a broad topic of evolutionary ecology. And the first talk will be given by Frédéric Delsuc from ISEM Montpellier. And Fred will speak about taxonomy and the use of genomic approach. Thanks, Jerome, for this introduction. So, uh, so I will be talking about uh, the, our discovery of a new species of long-nosed armadillo in French Guiana, and especially about uh, the uh, genome-wide species delimitation uh, approach that we used. That was mainly uh, done by Mathilde Barth uh, during her PhD that is partly funded by the, by the SEBA. So this is quite a long story, actually, that we, which started uh, like 30 years ago at Petit when the late uh, Francois Catzeflis bring back some samples uh, to Montpellier that were collected during the um, uh, Fond Sauvage rescue operations. And actually, I worked on those samples uh, on a first assessment of genetic diversity in these species of nine-banded armadillos, comparing at the time the diversity, the genetic diversity at Petit Sault versus what we had in the, uh, in the US population because this space is, is, has been invasive in the, in the US. And what you can see on this network, uh, haplotype network and phylogenetic tree uh, is that the samples from uh, French Guiana and the ones from the US are pretty divergent, as you can see here from the different numbers of uh, mutations. But of course, that's only a two-point uh, comparison. And actually, this species is the most widespread species of Xenatra, with a range across, with a Pan-American distribution from uh, Northern Argentina to the US. And uh, it occurs across diverse habitats. And it has been uh, invasive in the US uh, for only 200 years. Uh, but uh, still, it has invaded all the states in the southern uh, US. Uh, so here is a, a more complete uh, representation of the diversity of the species across the world distribution than my my colleague, Maya Clara Harteaga. It's based on the same uh, short mitochondrial marker I, I was just uh, showing about. And what uh, those data suggest is that there are four, uh, actually four different mitochondrial uh, lineages that are geographically uh, distributed. One in Central America, uh, one in Southern uh, America, one in French Guiana, which appears pretty distinct from uh, all the other things. and one with a Pan-American uh, distribution. So that's for Desipus novem cinctus, but there are also uh, other species in the genus, such as the um, airy long-nosed armadillo, which is actually the only armadillos with a fur. Uh, and it's pretty divergent morphologically, but as you can see, it fits in this radiation of different species and also there are some other uh, described species, such as Dasypus sabanicola and Mazai, that have been described, but actually fit within the Southern American lineage uh, of Dasypus novem cinctus. So it's pretty much of a mess, uh, and the, the taxonomy in there, and it needs clarification. So if we zoom out uh, at uh, uh, the level of the genus, this phylogeny also made on uh, some fragments of uh, mitochondrial genomes, uh, includes all the, disc the diff described species. So you, here, for example, you have uh, Dasypus caperi that also occur in French Guiana. And this species has been splitted recently in three different uh, species. You got here the uh, seven-bounded uh, armadillo, long-nosed armadillo. And, all, and here, this Dasypus novem cinctus uh, species complex that we want to try to um, Decipher. So for this, we used first uh, some classical morphological uh, investigation in the form of two uh, dif distinct approaches. One is, was uh, to um, use geometric morphometrics to study the variation in skull shape. And the other one was to investigate uh, hidden characters of uh, the cranium, such as the paranasal sciences that are some small cavities inside the bones uh, in, near the, the nose. 
and to see if those characters can be uh, distinct, dis diagnostic for the different uh, lineages we, we found. So the first study was uh, done by uh, Lionel Autier, my friend and colleagues at uh, ISEM. And uh, so for this, we scanned uh, 128 skulls for five species, and then used uh, 3D uh, morphomet geometric morphometrics to perform uh, statistical analysis of the, the cranial variation. And it, as you can see on this PCA here, we have a clear distinction between at least the South American group and the uh, other group. And actually the first axis is an axis of deformation of the cranium going from flat uh, uh, cranium to more dome-shaped cranium. Uh, as it is the case in the, in, uh, in the Guyana uh, group. So we have some evidence for some separation between different uh, groups here. It's clearer on the discriminant uh, uh, analysis. And we have at least four distinct morpho groups corresponding to the Northern group, the South American group, the Central group, and the one in French Guiana that is pretty uh, distinct from the other ones. So just to sum up this, this part, we are the, the Analysis of cranial variation supports four distinct uh, morphotypes uh, that are that fits uh, with the uh, mitochondrial data we saw just before, except that we didn't found these uh, Pan American lineages because we have uh, uh, the South American lineages that is clearly distinct in this in this uh, with this uh, data. Next, we looked at uh, the paranal sinuses, and it's a work that has been done by uh, Guillaume Billet at the museum in Paris. And uh, it was, so we, we looked at something that, that is often overlooked, the internal structure that you can access with CT scans. So uh, Guillaume segmented all the, the skulls that we, we had CT scans for. And to look at the variation in the different uh, species of the structures in different species, and you can see there are, uh, uh, clear differences between the, the, the species, but also within the Dazipus nomem synctus complex. These uh, structures are pretty uh, diverse. And in fact, you can classify the, the different uh, skulls based on the, on the structure of, this parana of those uh, paranasal sinuses in three distant groups, one uh, occurring in North and Central America, one uh, in South America, and the uh, Guyana shield specimens appear again uh, pretty distinct from the other thing, at least from this, uh, this point of view. So just, just to sum up here, we have clear uh, distinction of a southern morpho group as with the, uh, the, the morphometric geometrics. French Guiana appear really distinct again with uh, very uh, extended uh, parental sinuses. And the only thing we cannot uh, distinguish are the two uh, lineages between central and uh, northern lineages that cannot be distinguished at least from the from this sinus point of view. So in order to to decipherate all these uh, taxonomic conodrome, we use the genomic approach. So first we use uh, mitogenomics. So we sequenced the whole uh, mitogenome using some shotgun uh, sequencing for 81 uh, individuals across the uh, distribution. And to sample the nuclear uh, genomes, we use an exon capture uh, approach, targeting uh, 200 base pair exons, 1, 000, uh, 000, about 1,000 uh, loci, and also flanking sequence. So we have, in the end, uh, exons that we captured that, that represents or well, that are distributed more or less randomly across the different chromosomes of the genomes and that are about uh, 600 base pair lengths. So a lot of information, nuclear genomic information to try to delimit the, the, the different spaces. One problem is that you reach a very uh, representative uh, sampling of those, uh, those animals, uh, not easy to catch and not easy to get samples for. We had to rely on some rod kills, but also on museum uh, specimens. And this has con some consequences on the, on the, from the um, um, experimental point of view, because you end up 
having heterogeneous DNA extraction quality. And this could lead to some potential cross-contamination because you have samples that have low DNA level versus uh, very high DNA level. And also some probably some sequencing error that we need to take into account in the analysis. So what one thing we did first was to look at the, mitog the mitochondrial data uh, inspired by some uh, techniques that were developed to uh, filter the modern human contamination in the Neanderthal genome, so in the ancient DNA uh, um, field. So it just quickly, it's, it just, it's, just, it's based sorry, it's on, on a diagnostic position for the different uh, lineages that you define a priori. And then you looked in the mapping of the different reads uh, for heterozygous sites. And as the mitochondrial uh, genome is, up, uh, is haploid, those sites likely correspond to uh, some cross-contamination from other samples and other lineages. And then you can uh, identify from which uh, sample or at least which lineages the, the contamination come from. And that's what is uh, summarized here. So you can, uh, based on this, you can define an index of uh, the lineage uh, purity or contamination. And as we can see, most of the samples were not cross-contaminated, but we had two uh, cases where clearly we have uh, cross-contamination between two samples, and those samples have been um, excluded from further analysis of the mitochondrial data set. And uh, so if there are evidence, there is evidence for uh, cross-contamination from the mitogenome uh, data, it also applied, of course, to uh, the nuclear genomes. So we have to take this into account, uh, trying to define some filtering methods to uh, call SNPs, uh, and especially one, uh, one, uh, one filter and simple filter we used was to call heterozygous sites that are only supported by more than 30 to 70% of the reads that, uh, that were mapped. And that's just to show you the effect of those uh, filters on two uh, um, population genomic indices, the inbreeding coefficient here, or the, heter the level of uh, heterozygosity. So, don't, uh, so you have all the, the individuals here. And what basically uh, this figure is showing is that when you apply the filter, you get rid of all extreme values, including negative inbreeding uh, values of the inbreeding coefficient and uh, much more reasonable estimates of the heterozygosity. So it was, I think it shows that it's important to account for this kind of thing because otherwise you will have some uh, um, cross contamination that you can interpret as a mixture between the samples, whereas it's just an artifact of the, of the, procedure, the experimental procedure. So now we have a clean data set. We can do some uh, phylogenetic and species delimitation analysis. Here is the maximum likelihood tree for the 81 uh, mitogenomes. And on the other uh, side, the ones obtained from uh, the nuclear loci. And so the first thing you, need, you notice is, the two, is that the two trees are actually incongruent and they uh, disagree on the position of the French Guiana uh, or the Guianan lineage, uh, which is sister of all the other lineage in the mitochondrial uh, genomes, whereas it is um, sister of the South American clade uh, in the nuclear tree, which is kind of more uh, in line with the biographic uh, evidence. So we have some incongruence between the uh, mitogenomes and the uh, nuclear loci. And also, as you can see here, some cases of mitochondrial integration between uh, different uh, uh, lineages. And these uh, integrations, it always occur, or it, it, it's known to occur a lot uh, in mammals. But uh, what is important to notice here is that all those cases are located at the boundary of the different uh, uh, lineages and can be interpreted maybe as a secondary contact between, uh, between those uh, diver diverge uh, uh, species. So there is a case here uh, between the southern, uh, it's actually in, uh, in Hamapa between the Guyanan and the South American lineage. Same thing here between two other uh, lineage, the central one versus the South American one in uh, Venezuela. And here we have uh, 
many individuals that have been in progress uh, in the blue uh, northern, northern uh, lineages. Okay, so now just a summary of uh, all the different species delimitation approaches we used to try to clarify this uh, species complex. And the major uh, message here is that all, almost all uh, approaches agree uh, for defining four different spaces uh, corresponding to the different lineages we have here with some cases of mitochondrial uh, integration, as I showed here, and also some uh, cases of nuclear admixture that uh, occurred between some lineages. It's, it could be uh, visualized maybe uh, uh, more easily uh, on this PCA of uh, uh, genomic variation. And as you can see here, there is a net immediate uh, individual that is, in fact, at the, uh, um, an introgressed uh, uh, individual between the Guyana lineage here and the South uh, American lineage. And it has an intermediate position suggesting that it might be an hybrid between the, those two uh, those two lineage. So uh, with all these, we have morphological uh, um, evidence, genomic evidence showing that uh, there are at least four, uh, there are four distinct species. And so we revised the taxonomy of, the, of this um, species complex. And in fact, the, so the name was of the nine banded armadillo is Dazipus nomem cinctus, but the uh, holotype is actually from Brazil. So the uh, name of the southern clade will apply to this. So that means that the invasive populations in the US from which 90 9% of the uh, literature on these spaces is done, uh, will have to become uh, renamed Desipus mexicanus, but that's the way taxonomy is. Uh, and uh, the uh, central lineages would be Desipus fenestratus, and then we uh, name and describe a new species endemic from the Guyana shield as Desipus guyanensis, because yeah, as the distribution suggested, it's uh, distributed from uh, Amapa to the east of the Venezuela, which fits quite perfectly with the uh, biogeographic definition of the, the Guyana shield. And here it is a beautiful photo of Dazipus guyanensis uh, taken by Quentin Martinez. Uh, it's not easy to distinguish it. And in fact, nobody has really proposed something morphologically. It's just it's bigger than uh, the other one uh, in the complex. And there are also some uh, characters that you cannot really see in the field, such as uh, nine to uh, 11 thoracic vertebrae, for example. And in terms of uh, uh, resources we want to make available, we scan the whole uh, holotype specimen that is from uh, Petit Sault, and we, we make it available for people to play with and to look at different uh, characters as a, as a digital uh, 3D models. And uh, last week, actually, we came here to sequence uh, a paratype using the Oxford Nanopore long read technology to try to get uh, um, reference genomes for this uh, new species. So it's, it was done at the Institut Pasteur and it's currently ongoing. And uh, a little bit now of uh, natural history, so if I can put this video here. So until now, we didn't even know how many liters does uh, these spaces were doing, but uh, the JPOG just took this, uh, this or sent us the, this uh, little video showing one mother and four uh, offsprings. When, what is interesting is that uh, this species, or at least Dazipus novem cinctus, is known to make to use uh, polyembryony, which is a mode of uh, reproduction that is completely unique uh, among mammals and even maybe uh, vertebrates. That means that every female uh, systematically leads to four quadruplets, only males or only females, that are genetically uh, identical. And that's something that we could now test uh, from the genomic point of view, thanks to uh, uh, rocks and Chubb that uh, uh, found a roadkill female with uh, different embryos that we can now use for trying to prove that these are actually four uh, clones. 
and uh, trying to understand how this uh, peculiar mode of uh, reproduction could affect also the genomic diversity of the, of the species. And I would leave you with a more beautiful photo <laughs> here. And thank you for your attention and just thank the financial support of the ERC and the CIBA. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any questions? Hello. Um, if I you understood well, uh, you have no morphological character to distinguish these species. Is that true? No, there are, but uh, they are not obvious on the field. So, is for the, example, is the skull? If I have. Yes, uh, so they have this peculiar uh, uh, sinuses, but you can only see them if you scan the, the skull and reconstruct them, which is not really practical. Uh, mm. They are also bigger or larger, but it's uh, super difficult to, um, to estimate if you don't have a large uh, sample. And also there are, there are some uh, distinct or diagnostic characters uh, on the different scales on the knees, for example, but it's really not obvious. Okay, and is the only species that occur in the Guyanas? The only there, one? Is, is that the only species no. that there are others? There's another one, there's the greater long-nosed armadillo. Which uh, is very different. Yeah, but uh, it's not uh, easy to distinguish them, especially ah. when they're, as they are juveniles. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Frederick, for amazing work. Um, so, if I understood correctly, you you eventually identified some individuals with admixed that, that are admixed with the genomic DNA, right? Yeah. Have you looked back at the morphology of these ones, especially uh, because the, uh, some of the specimens were genotyped? So, yeah. Do we have intermediate phenotypes? Or? So no. So unfortunately, the ones we have. Uh, found um, to be at least introgressed uh, from the nuclear point of view, you see. Uh, we don't have the CT scans, so, <laughs> so we cannot, we can check uh, really. But uh, yeah, what we are planning, we are sequencing some genomes from some admixed uh, individual to know exactly which part of the genomes uh, might be involved in this uh, admixture. Uh, and yes, morphologically, maybe it would be a good idea to, to try to find some, but uh, this seems to be really rare. Uh, only a few cases uh, on the about 100 or well, 60, uh, 60 individuals. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I have another one? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so, the, the, um, the northern part of the distribution where the species is invasive, it, it hasn't been introduced. It's a natural expansion, right? Uh, but there are, there are admixed two there, but with what? They what? They, they are admixed. You said they are admixed in the northern part of the distribution? Uh, not, not in the US. Uh, there are there is so uh, there are some uh, uh, individuals that have been uh, uh, introgressed from uh, the mitochondrial point of view, and we think it's uh, it's been it reflects some uh, um, uh, move. Well, they they probably differentiated at some point and then retract, uh, and then leave only the the mitogenome on some individuals. And then they, they became invasive to the US. So the ones in the US are just like one haplotype. <laughs> they, are, they had a very, very big bottleneck uh, at the colonization. Only if we know that uh, historically, because it has been recorded on every state uh, and the progress is very well uh, uh, known. So they crossed the Rio Grande uh, in uh, 1850. And then very few individuals uh, crossed. And uh, uh, they are almost uh, monomorphic in the, in the US. And they, they expanded in 200 years. And also, the fun thing is that uh, some people in the early uh, 90s used some, uh, because it was a very exotic animal to have in the US, they used some in some circus in Florida, and they escaped. And now we have two different uh, populations that, that have you know, expanding 
west and uh, east and west, and there there is probably a contact zone somewhere uh, around Georgia between those two populations. So, so there is also something interesting to do in the population genomics of the this invasion. Very successful. Okay. Another question. Uh, yeah, thank you. J just to be sure, uh, uh, when I go to the field now, we still have four uh, species of tattoo. It's just the one we called um, Novum Cinctus. It's now called Guyanensis, yes. right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Please report <laughs> any sightings. Oui. Um, yes. Oui. Sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> In terms of... <laughs> In terms of the individuals that you found in Tugres, are they F1s, F2s, or, you, or the very ancient integration? Well, we don't really know. And just uh, the one on the PCA looks like it's uh, maybe it's a recent hybrid. So mm -hmm. it might be just secondary contact between the, yeah. the, the zones. So. OK. All right. Thank you. Finish? Oh. Thank you, Frederic. Thank you.